Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Developing a Proper Worldview. Um, this will be our 17th episode, and uh, we've been doing these weekly. I was just thinking about it here as a, before I was jumping into this, that um, I've talked previously about how long this endeavor is. Um, Lord willing, if the Lord gives me time and allows me to continue to do this, um, I have hundreds of videos that I want to go through with you guys. And... Um, you know, if I if I were to continue the pace of one a week, it, it's going to take. You know, I I was thinking it's probably going to take like ten years to get through all this. Um, but then I was just thinking, you know, there's nothing really stopping me from doing more than one, uh, one a week. Um, you know, I I, I probably still title them uh, week one, week two, week three, so on and so forth, just because that's the pattern I've already set. And uh, you know, if you wanted to watch one a week, you could certainly do that. But um, I might consider doing a, a, a couple a week um, just to, to speed up the process uh, just because we have so much material to get through um, and I'm excited about that we've, we've got a lot of good stuff to look into um, I think I've got uh, a folder full probably 200 300 DVDs um, some of them three hours a piece you know we break them up into one hour sections um, so you can imagine how long that's going to take. Plus, I think there's probably about 25 more uh, documentaries that I'm going to purchase, uh, Lord willing, through the course of this. And uh, we'll go through those as well. So um, I just purchased some more based on uh, this, this Kent Hovind series we're doing. He mentions um, Creatures That Defy Evolution. And I remember really liking those when I watched them. Uh, so I purchased those and, and we'll go through those uh, before we get through the evolution section here. Um, which is where we're at. We're, we're in the midst of that. We're, we're picking up with, uh, we just finished Creation Seminar Series number three, uh, which was on dinosaurs in the Bible. Uh, we're going to start um, session number four uh, tonight here, and, and that one's on lies in the textbook. And um, I hope it's been as beneficial to you as it was to me. Like, like it, these Kent Hoban, um DVDs here, or um, I think I first watched them on, on YouTube. So um, just discovering those early on in my faith, you know, I, I think I probably found these back in, I don't know, it was probably 2004, 2005 when I first watched these. And it was just, I mean, he, he quickly became a hero in the faith to me because um, he's obviously put in so much time and effort and words can't you know be expressed about how much i appreciate that um when somebody just you know the lord bl touches their heart um to put in the work they do so much research put forth so much time and effort um to to get this information readily available to us and to teach us i think about like um will kinney um who, who um i i just appreciate so much with the, with the King James information. He, he does so much research. He has so many different articles. Um, any problem that you encounter, he's got an answer to. And I feel like that's how Hovind is with, with, with the theory of evolution. Plus, there's other ones out there that, that um, are just as good but not as impactful for me because I suppose Hovind was the first one I discovered and because he just he makes it so easy to understand. Uh, but Answers in Genesis... Um, which is uh, Ken Ham. I've got several of his DVDs that we're not actually going to go through just because I haven't watched them yet. Um, but um, the Answers in Genesis Ministry, they, they're the ones who do the, the Ark Museum uh, where they have a replica of Noah's Ark out in Kentucky. Um, I've been there. That's actually where I purchased those DVDs. Um, and I bought all of his books. I think I got like 50 of his books. So um, there's just a tremendous wealth of, of information available through Answers in Genesis. And then there's the uh, Creation Research Institute, I, I believe is what it's called, CRI or CSI, Creation Science Institute. Um, I can't recall. I, th I think it's CSI, Creation Science Institute. Uh, it's Dr. Henry Morris's um, uh, ministry. 
Uh, he's passed on, so I believe his son John Morris and his grandson, uh, Henry Morris III, I think, um, are active in that ministry now. But but he's been wonderful as well. Um, just his study Bible. Uh, he's got a, uh, a King James study Bible. That's one of the most beautiful Bibles ever. I've actually um, given that away to a couple different people because it's such a precious. It's a just a big Bible full of his notes. Um, like uh, I don't even think I got through Genesis just because Genesis one and he's got like pages and notes on it and um, just a great resource he's done um, several speeches I've, I've, if you're watching this um, and you're on my channel here on YouTube you, you can go and look up some of the sermons um, or maybe I just have one I, I've got one or two uh, of his sermons because um, I, I don't think he was a preacher so I don't think he often gave sermons uh, but he did one called the science or science and the Bible and it's on my channel and phenomenal he gives a great analogy uh, for the Trinity on, on how the heavens declare the glory of God and the heavens um, and, and and the firmament and creation or no I'm sorry create how, how creation bears witness to the Godhead um, that verse I, I can't remember where that's at is that first Peter um, but wherever it is, he, 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 he shows how creation is a trinity of trinities. Time, space, matter is a trinity. And then within each of those, there's a trinity. Uh, time is past, present, future. Um, space is, is height, breadth, and width. And uh, matter is uh, liquid, solid, gas. So you got a trinity of trinities um, that declare the Godhead, the, the trinity. And just a wonder, wonderful um, idea. Oh, and he also preached on Psalm 22 um, about the worm. How? Because Psalm 22 is a prophecy written like a thousand years before Christ, uh, but it but it depicts the crucifixion. And and at one point, um, prophetically, uh, David writes, "I am a worm," you know, speaking uh, as Jesus on that cross. And the word there used for worm. Um, in the original Hebrew is actually a specific kind of worm. It's it's uh, I think it's called the scarlet or the the crimson the crimson worm. And uh, just a brief synopsis of what that is. It's it's this little tiny worm that's red in color, and when it's going to give birth, it'll burrow into a piece of wood, um, and and then uh, lay its eggs in the wood, and then position its body. Uh, between the eggs and 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 the the external world, you know, it'll it'll sandwich itself into the wood hole there, um, so tight that it can't possibly escape. It's a suicide mission. It knows it's going to die, so it burrows itself into that piece of wood, lays its eggs behind it, and then dies. And then uh, when the eggs hatch, they're able to feed on the the body of the worm, and and the 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 color the 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 red. Uh, liquid or the red ink whatever's causing that worm to be red spills out and stains the wood a crimson color and that's mind-blowing that the Lord used that word in 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 the uh, in Psalm 22 the prophecy about the crucifixion because it's such an amazing word picture of what the crucifixion was how Christ died upon that piece of wood you know, he in Psalm 22, he calls himself that worm. I am a worm. And then he dies on that wood, spills his red blood, you know, stains the wood and gives his body as a sacrifice for us, his children. And so just amazing to hear him talk about that. And then um, he's got uh, devotionals that were just always phenomenal. As a matter of fact, I should resubscribe to those. I haven't read those in quite a few years, but um, daily uh, devotion. I think you can even get the book. There's a little devotional book. Like I'm sure you guys are familiar with Our Daily Bread. Uh, there's a similar one from Creation Science Institute with, from Dr. Henry Morris. Um, and and um, to me, it's the best devotional out there, or the best I've ever read. Um, just so so good um, so there's other resources out there besides Dr. Kenthoven and uh, we'll get into some of them where we're, we're going to look at uh, that that uh, creation uh, creatures that defy evolution we're going to look at uh, unlocking the mysteries of life a, a pretty eye-opening uh, documentary icons of evolution another really good one and I'm trying to think if there's anything else that we'll look at um, that might be it um, I do have a, a an a DVD from um, creation ICR 
That's the name. It's not CSI or CRI. It's ICR, Institute of Creation Research, ICR.org. I'm sorry. So that, that's Henry Morris's organization. And I have a DVD of his too, but I haven't watched that either. I think that's just like a, an introduction to, the, to their museum or their facilities or whatever. So um, probably won't watch that either. Um, unless maybe I'll, I'll go through those um, in my free time here. I'll start watching those. Ken Ham and that that ICR one um, and if I think it'll be beneficial we'll, we'll cover it on the series here but um, so yeah that that's where we're at it, it like like I always say if, you, if you're jumping into this this is the first one you're watching um, please stop watching it right here and and go back and watch them in numerical order um, it's important to build upon each step uh, we're laying brick upon brick in this foundation and uh, the gospel being paramount knowing Jesus Christ being born again having his spirit within you so that you can have spiritual understanding that you can see the world with spiritual discernment um, that is foundational that is key without that nothing else matters and so you need that and then and then from there we're, we're building on, on how God is creator and the theory of evolution that we're taught is is false it's pseudoscience it's not real it's a lie and uh, like I say, Kent Hovind does a masterful job exposing that and showing that. And um, so that's where we're at. Um, without further ado, I think we're going to jump into it. And uh, we're starting, uh, excuse me, session number four here tonight. So uh, let's, uh, let's get going. All right, so here we go. Uh, seminar part number four, Lies in the Textbooks. Uh, let's do this. Welcome, Welcome to, to our, our seminar, seminar tape number four on lies in the textbooks. I taught high school science for 15 years, and now I travel to seminars on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. And I'm concerned that what kids are being taught in our classroom is simply not true. There are some lies in our textbooks. In our first few seminar tapes, we talk about a variety of lies in the books. I like science. I'm not against science. I collect science textbooks. I have actually hundreds of them, and I really, really like science. But I'm concerned there are some things in these books that just simply are not true. Somebody wants your kids to believe a particular theory, which is understandable. Everybody tries to convert others to, to their belief system. I'm going to try to convert you to my belief system. That's perfectly fine to get for everybody to try to, try to do that. However, you don't want to use lies to accomplish that. So I'm going to tell you about some of the lies in the textbooks. In my first three videos, on number one, we talk about how students are being lied to about the Big Bang. It's a big dud. It didn't happen. They're being, They're being lied to about the age of the earth. The earth is not billions of years old. They're being lied to about the caveman. There's never been a caveman, unless you mean Osama bin Laden. Okay. They're being lied to about the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs did not live millions of years ago. Dinosaurs lived with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And on this tape, we're going to talk about at least 25 or 26, maybe even 30 if we get time, more lies that students have. Praise God, I'm just thinking back, like, he recorded this in 2003 and just you know a really short time after this i don't remember exactly when like i said in the intro maybe 2005 2006 somewhere around there i'm trying to think back but just shortly after he recorded these i discovered them um what a blessing from the lord like like i don't remember how i would have come across these like i wasn't involved when i first got saved i was super skeptical of churches like I stayed out of church I didn't really have any I didn't know I didn't even know what the word fellowship meant I didn't you know I didn't know any Christians um, and I, I thought we were in the last days and so I thought the, the that the pulpits were full of wolves in sheep's clothing because uh, you know Jesus warned often uh, per, perhaps more than anything else about false teachers in the last days and so I was convinced you know just because the few times I had actually gone to a church it felt so dry and religious um, which is antithetical to, to what real Christianity is and so I was so turned off by that I thought man surely you know we're in the last days it's it's like I just didn't trust the churches and I didn't know where the real Christians were I didn't know how to find real Christians and so I walked uh, alone for for several years perhaps like the first three four years of my faith and uh, just you know sat and studied the word and um learned from the spirit and so i don't know how i would have come across these 
I, I would think like it, it had to been the internet. It had to just been a search, you know, and, and so like, praise God for the internet. Uh, you know, like what a blessing. I know the internet can be incredibly damaging and, and, and there are conspiratorial, um, uh, coincidences, so to speak, or, or like it's called the web, you know, and, and sin and, and whatnot is often referred to as like a snare, a net, a web that catches us and entangles us. It's so it's, it's a world wide web. It's a worldly web, um, that ensnares the whole world. WWW, um, is, is, um, I don't know, is that, that Hebrew? is the Hebrew letter W the six in, in some, um, linguistic form, WWW actually equals six, six, six. And so like there, there's thing, like I said, conspiratorial things that we know there's no coincidences in life. So like, I, I see things like that and I don't go off on tangents a lot of times, but I'll see it and I recognize it. Like, I, I feel like that's a discernment the Lord gives you. Like, uh, like for instance, on the dollar bill, if you look closely at it, the background of the dollar bill is a web. It's a spider's web. It's a snare. Um, you know, and then, of course, it's got the all-seeing eye of Horus on the back, uh, which is Lucifer. We'll, we'll get into all that further down the line as well. But there, there are no coincidences. So, so you need to take note of everything that you see. Um, corporations use satanic logos and things like that that ought to just register in your head and go, hmm, that's something to keep an eye on, something to be aware, you know, and, and so I think the, 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 the web is certainly an instrument that the devil can use to ensnare and to grab hold um, of hearts and of minds and, and, and to lead into various temptations. But also it can be used as a blessing. It can be used for very good things. Like, I've discovered so many great things that I wouldn't have discovered otherwise. You know, I'd, uh, Pastor John Piper, back in 2005, 2006, whatever it was, um, you know, uh, the Doctrines of Grace, um, Charles Spurgeon, uh, Dr. Kent Hoven, uh, Answers in Genesis, Will Kinney, uh, Jack Chick, uh, Richard Bennett, um, just so, Ian Paisley, um, Brian Borgman, uh, Pastor Brian Borgman, just all, Pastor Paul Washer, all these various things that I've discovered through the internet uh, that have just been such a tremendous, tremendous blessing to me. Uh, my, my gospel signs I was able to order through the internet. Uh, we're able to get gospel tracks through the internet. I've ordered Bibles through the internet. Uh, Bible Gateway is a cool app that you can use. Uh, the New World Order studies, you know, finding... Uh, good correct information uh being you know there's a lot of disinformation out there as well a lot of rabbit trails that lead away from the truth um and and that's why i'm doing this series hopefully to lead you along the, the correct path and to avoid those various things that take us astray but just just how, what a blessing the internet is you know and like i say he recorded these i, I assume he was putting these out via vhs back in the day and uh, DVD, and then somehow, some way, you know, the Lord blessed me and 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 uh, put these in my hands, and and it's been uh, full steam ahead ever since. After face, face in your textbooks. textbooks, and then on tape number five, five, we're going to tell you what you can do about it, it and some, some of the dangers of this philosophy. philosophy. More, More lies, lies in the textbooks. textbooks. Let me set, set the record straight, straight right up front. front. I am I'm not, not trying to get evolution out of the schools. schools. I'm, I'm not, not trying, trying to get, get creation, creation into the schools. schools. I, just I just want the lies, lies out of the textbooks. textbooks. I, think I think we'll find, if, if we, we take the lies, lies out of the books, books there's, there's nothing, nothing left to support, support the evolution theory. Okay, okay, well that's, that's their, their problem. problem. If all you, you have, have to support your theory are things that have been proven wrong, wrong years ago, I think it's about time to get into theory. Is there anybody here who thinks teachers or textbooks should be allowed to deliberately lie to students for any reason? Right? Wisconsin, Wisconsin has a law that requires textbooks to be accurate. accurate. So, so does Alabama. Alabama. Textbooks, textbooks shall be adequate and current. Texas, Texas says instructional material shall, shall be factual. Florida, Florida has a law that says instructional material shall be accurate. California, California says textbooks, textbooks shall be factually accurate. Minnesota. 
says the teacher that shall not deliberately suppress or distort subject matter. The problem is, absolutely none of those states, including your state, enforce the law as it's written on the book. The books are simply not accurate. Here's a public school textbook from 1908. It's told the kids in 1908, God created the heavens and the earth in six days. Amen. And all that was made was very good. Prayer is a duty, but it's made to pray without a sincere desire of heart. God governs the world in infinite wisdom. Public school textbook. Here's a public school textbook from the year 2000. Evolution is a fact, not theory. Birds are also non-birds and humans are non-humans. No person who pretends to an understanding of the natural world can deny these facts. I think things have changed a little bit, folks. By the way, when he says evolution is a fact, this is called a mantra. They think if you say it long enough and loud enough, everybody will start believing it. It's not a fact. Evolution is a religion. This textbook says, boys and girls, even though... I just saw that today on Facebook. Somebody posted this uh, from a science website, supposed confirmed science you know climate change is real chemtrails don't exist um nonsense but the one that really stuck out to me evolution is a fact it's um it angers you that they blatantly lie to children like that it is not a fact science is observable and experimental macro evolution of one kind into another kind has never ever been observed and through experimentation, it's never been done. So it is not provable science. It is theory. Um, and like he's saying, it's it's religion. It's which you know, it's, which is what theory is—a faith in an idea. It's religion, and it's an unprovable one with without any facts to support it. They take microevolution, which is just variation within a species, and they present that as fact for macroevolution. It's sleight of hand. It's, it, you know, because we see variations in species, because microevolution is observable, therefore cosmic evolution is true, um, you know, uh, 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 macroevolution is true, chemical evolution is true, which has no evidence for all these things, but they, they, they apply the word evolution to, the, which microevolution shouldn't be included in, that's just variation. But they take that word and apply it to this broad spectrum of all these different things uh, that aren't accurate. It, it, it applies to variation and none of those other things. Um, so it's a blatant lie. It's, 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 and the Bible says it's, it's wicked men that suppress truth. They hold truth down in unrighteousness. They don't want the truth. So they hold it down in their minds. They push it aside. And it says that they're willfully ignorant. It's interesting, too, that in the book of Romans, it talks about how men will profess themselves to be wise. And that's actually what the word homo sapien means. Wise man. They've professed themselves to be wise. Which I think is a, a sign of the end times. That, you know, you can read that progression in Romans 1 as a progression towards the last days so in the last days when men call themselves wise when men refer to themselves as homo sapiens most scientists and religious leaders no longer see evolution and religion as in conflict a minority of christian fundamentalists remain opposed to evolutionary biology this is called slanted journalism a minority of Fundamentalists, they're trying to marginalize those, even, even though it's the majority of the population of America that believes it's not the minority. Look what it says over here. Um, it says, creation science states that all species were created by God over 10,000 years ago, and that they've not evolved since. By the way, stop right there. That is not what creation science teaches. Creation science teaches that all the kinds of animals were created roughly 10,000 years ago. And the only evolution has been variations within those kinds. So they're, so they're setting, setting up a straw, straw man here so they can knock it down and think they, they won the argument. argument. Keep reading here. As, As scientific issues, we know these assertions are false. Over here, they tell the kids, if we prevent our secondary school students from learning what science has to offer, let me stop right there. I'm not trying to prevent students from learning what science has to offer. I love science. I'm trying to prevent students from being lied to. 
But man, but man show, show us, us what, what does science, science have to offer? Things that we can observe, observe or test and demonstrate. Test evolution, evolution is not part of science. science. That's, That's the problem. problem. Watch, Watch this now. now. If we prevent our students from learning what science has to offer, we run the risk that they will not be able to compete effectively in college classrooms or in today's global economy. This is the evolutionist altar call. Right there. The world will be destroyed if we don't preach evolution. Oh, the sky is falling. We've got to get more evolution or we're all going to die. They somehow think that their religion is important in our schools, and it's not. This textbook has over 100 pages. Or evolution theory. Think about that too. I'm sure you've run into that in society. The idea that um, if we reject macroevolution, we won't be able to do science. Think like we'll f American technology will fall behind Japanese and the Chinese and and all that. But think about how insane that is. Macroevolution, a change of one species into another, has nothing to do with biological sciences, nuclear sciences, computer sciences. It, it, it affects nothing, but they make it seem like it does. They make it seem like if we reject evolution, we lose out on, on rockets and computers and, and, and medical advances. It's insane. It's, it's, it's a lie. It's evil. But they willfully suppress the truth, and so they blindly believe these things. Like, I'm sure the person who wrote that article believed what they were writing. But, like, he says it's a straw argument. And so, like, one thing you learn from watching debates is that it's important to define um, words and phrases and ideas. Like, he did there. Like, if you were talking to the person who wrote that textbook, as soon as they say creation scientists believe uh, that God created all species, hold up, stop. We don't believe that. And then explain kinds. It defeats their whole argument right out the bait right out the gate because because they've created an argument based on this misinterpretation of the terms and then and then they think they can win that argument because oh you know all the species blah 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 you know and they can go from that but as soon as you back up and go hold on that's not what we believe we believe kinds here's what kinds are now they have nowhere to go they can't argue against that they're using fallacies to argue straw men and it's like that way with almost every debate almost every debate um and 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 we are probably guilty of it too without being aware is just a misunderstanding of terms or beliefs like somebody says uh you know i believe this this and this and and in your mind you're you're defining what they believe you're defining the terms and the ideas that they use based on on how you would define them but they might define them differently and so you have to find out like well well, well, well what do you mean when you say uh, like for instance Calvinism when people debate Calvinism well hold on what do you mean by Calvinism what do you mean by predestination you know what do you mean by elect what do you mean by these words because perhaps you're arguing um, with with a bad definition you've set up a straw man in your in your head that's not what I mean when I say those words so we need to define terms always define terms always stop and 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 ask people what do you mean by this word it's important to do with cults too cults will use phrases like born again and 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 uh redeemed and justified but they have different definitions of what those words mean so you have to define terms is presented to the kids now, now one mention of creation, creation. If, if they do, do mention creation, creation it's, it's always, always in ridicule, ridicule like the one, like the one i showed you a minute ago, ago. A minority, a minority of Christian, Christian fundamentalists. fundamentalists. Folks, things, things have changed in our textbook. Now, now, this, this chart, chart shows how the atheists rate the United States based on how well they teach evolution. If, if your, your state, state is red, they think you're doing a lousy job, job of teaching evolution. evolution. Yay. Yay! Go, Go Wisconsin! I'm in Minnesota, Minnesota. Liberal states are doing a very good or excellent job of teaching evolution. They ought to be ashamed, ashamed of themselves. Is there anybody, anybody that thinks teachers or textbooks should be allowed to use outdated or false information just to get students to believe a particular theory? No? no? Okay. okay. Anybody, anybody here that thinks teachers that lie, deliberately lie, should be fired? fired. Okay, okay, fair, fair enough. enough. No. Anybody, anybody here that thinks textbooks with lies should be banned or the lies torn out? out. Sure. sure. Okay, good. So we're all on the same page here. Now, it's always amazed me how two people can look at the same thing. And come, and come to opposite, opposite conclusions of what, what they are, are seeing. seeing. Two, Two people, people can look at Grand Canyon. Canyon. One, One of them believes in evolution. evolution. 
He looks at the canyon and says, wow, look what the Colorado River did for millions and millions of years. The Bible believing Christian stands there, looks at the same canyon, and says, wow, look what the flood did in about 30 minutes. Now, how was that canyon formed anyway? This textbook says over millions of years, the Colorado River has carved the Grand Canyon from solid rock. Now, just slow down a minute. Kids, it is a fact Grand Canyon exists. How many have been to Grand Canyon? I taught our science study in Grand Canyon. Avid I like Grand Canyon. Beautiful place. Big hole in the ground. Now, there are two interpretations of how it got there. The evolutionists have an interpretation, and so do the creationists. The evolutionist is going to tell you that canyon formed slowly by a little water and lots of time. Millions of years. The creationist is going to tell you, oh, the canyon formed quickly by lots of water and a little bit of time. The guys who believe in evolution are continually trying to erase the line between their interpretation and the fact column, and they want you to somehow think that what they interpret as evidence is now part of the fact. You gotta, you gotta really, really watch them on this. this. They're, They're pretty slick. slick. This textbook author, author does it just blatantly. blatantly. He, he says, says, The Colorado, Colorado River has cut through layer upon layer of rock over millions of years. Now just hold on a minute. minute. I was in a debate, debate one time, time and this atheist said, Oh, but you're so dumb. dumb. Don't, Don't you know, know it took millions, millions of years to make Grand Canyon? I said, Well, sir, I taught our science for years. I really enjoy studying Grand Canyon. I said, Did you know if you built a dam across Grand Canyon, that would take a lot of dirt, by the way, but if you did, a huge lake would fill in behind it. Did you, Did you know some, some of the water, water from Montana, Montana drains, drains through the Grand, Grand Canyon? Canyon? It's, it's a, a huge, huge drainage area. I said, sir, sir, did you know, know that in between, between these two red lines, lines what we call, call the snow, snow line, line, there's, there's a, ridge a ridge right, right there. there. The Grand, Grand Canyon, Canyon enters at the far right, right over here. here. The elevation the of the river at that, at that point is 2,800 feet above sea level. level. The river flows downhill for 270 miles and comes out the other side. And in, in between, between, while the river's river flowing down, down, the ground is rising up and then slowly coming back down. down. It, is it is so wide, 270, 270 miles, that you don't notice it until you get way back and look at it in a satellite. satellite. But, but if you look at it in a cross-section, this schematic shows the difference here. The river enters right here and flows downhill, it comes out the other side. It's actually going through a giant ridge, 270 miles long. At the highest point of the ridge, the river is at about 1,800 foot elevation, so it's nearly a one mile drop down into the canyon. Really big hole in the ground. I said, now, sir, there are a couple things you ought to consider about Grand Canyon. I said, did you know that the top of Grand Canyon is higher than the bottom? He said, uh, yes. I said, sir, did you know the river runs to the bottom? He said, said, yes. yes. I, said, I said, sir, did you know the top, the top is higher than where the river enters the canyon? The canyon? By over 4,000 4, feet. I said, I said sir, did you know that rivers don't, don't flow uphill? <laughs> I said, sir, did you know there is no delta? delta? Nobody, Nobody knows where the mud is that got washed out of there, but it's probably out in the Pacific Ocean. Ocean. They can't find the delta for Grand Canyon. There is no possible way that river made that canyon. Grand Canyon, Grand Canyon is quite obviously a washed out spillway. Hmm. There used to be two big lakes. The lack of a delta is pretty interesting. The Mississippi River, you know, flows from here in Minnesota down to what is it, Louisiana, and then goes into the Gulf of Mexico. And like it's actually one of the evidences of, of a young earth because they know how much sediment uh, the Mississippi River deposits into the Gulf of Mexico each year. They've actually measured it. And then they look at the Gulf of Mexico and they can see the, the mud, the, the sediment that's been deposited there over time. And they know how much is there. They can measure that. So then they can calculate, well, if it's doing this much per year and there's this much here now, we know it's X amount of years. And it turns out to be about 4,000 years, right around the time of Noah's flood. Um, so it couldn't possibly be, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions or, or billions of years or however old. I think they say there is 4.6 billion years old or whatever. There's no way. It's impossible. That delta would be that that the deposits in the Gulf of Mexico would be so much bigger. So it's in, interesting to think that they say the Colorado River, which flows down along the bottom of the canyon, while the canyon actually goes up. So if if it was if you think about like if it started as all land and the river started, you know eroding away 
then the river would have started here. How would the river flow up? You know, it, it, it can't flow uphill. So that it's an impossibility. Um, so right there, that, that theory is blown out of the water, uh, so to speak. Um, but also um, that idea about the deposits, about the delta. If the Colorado River is washing all this dirt away, where's the delta at the end of it? Where Where's all that mud? But if the flood did it, if you had like, if that whole section of earth there, that whole area of the Grand Canyon was like soft sediment or whatever. And then after the flood, um, it created this huge lake up in the Wyoming, Montana, Idaho era, area or whatever, that then broke through this soft land and just washed it all away, you know, and just like in a huge, like in a couple minutes, just, you know, and just washed it all away. It could have kept flowing, like he said, way out into the Pacific. But like you can you can do this experimentally. You could take like you could take a, a big pile of dirt in your backyard, you know, a big mound of dirt, and take like a garden hose and stick it along one side and turn it on slowly, like a river, and and watch and see if it erodes a canyon in there. No matter how long you wait, it's not going to do it. Especially if you build the dirt like the Grand Canyon, lower on one end, higher on the other, and you start the 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 hole is over here the water is just going to back up and, and keep it's not going to it's not going to create a canyon but then if you do like a flood experiment on this dirt and you just come with a huge bucket of water and throw it at it fast like a like a spillway it'll it'll brush away a big canyon it'll make a canyon it's observable um it's also mount st helens did the same thing there's a mini Grand Canyon uh, where Mount St. Helens exploded. Happened like that. Catastrophe causes this, not not slow erosion. Grand Lake, Lake and Hopi Lake, and they got too full, full one day. Who knows, Who knows when? when? I suspect shortly after the flood, maybe a few hundred years later, the ice caps melted or something, and the lakes got too full, and the water went over the top while the ground was still relatively soft. Within the first few hundred years, washed out that canyon in a hurry. Yeah. There are still beaches where the lakes used to be. They call them Grand Lake and Hopi Lake. The lake is long gone, but you can still see the beach line where the lake used to be. Mm. Grand Canyon is a washed out spillway, folks. The water got too deep, went over the top, and washed out that whole region in a real big hurry. So when they tell you it took millions of years, they're lying to you. It did not. See, the it's observable not evidence possible. makes sense. If you look at the way most and rivers you can come experiment together, almost and prove all rivers it. join at what are called That's acute angles, less than 90 degrees. You can look at any map of the world, nearly all rivers come together and keep going the same general direction. Well, if you look at Grand Canyon, the rivers on the left, lower left side join at acute angles, normal river pattern. If you look at the right side, the rivers go backwards and run into the channel and turn around and come back the other way. This is evidence of a big lake that is draining. Any farmer that's ever built a dam to hold water to feed his cows or something or water his cows will tell you, once the water goes over the top of the dam, it can wash it out in a hurry. And it doesn't wash away the whole dam, it washes one slot, wherever the water finds the weakest point. So the water's running backwards off the dam to hit the lower channel, turn around, come back the other way. Grand Canyon was not formed by the Colorado River, folks. Grand Canyon was formed by a flood. A lot of water with a little bit of time. Are there any farmers or veterinarians in the crowd that might know what this machine is? Anybody know what that is? What is that, sir? So you see, it's a lie in the textbook. He, like he said, he's not saying teach creation, because we can't prove that the flood did it. The absurd, the we can observe our, our theory makes more sense than the river. The river is impossible, you know. But yet they still put that in the textbook. The flood is is possible and logical, um, but it's a theory. So you know, he's not saying teach that a flood did it. We can speculate that a flood did it. If you can come up with another theory. You know, by all means, speculate away, but the river is a lie. The river did not create the canyon. Calf puller. <clears throat> That's a what? A calf puller. Mm -hmm. Once in a while, a cow has a hard time having that baby calf. And so to get the calf puller out, tie the cable around the calf's leg and <coughs> jack the calf out of the cow. You get a few tons of pressure on there, that calf comes right out, no problem. One day this farmer was out pulling a calf. It was a breech birth, the back feet are coming out first. Not good, but hey, it happened once in a while. And so the farmer had the calf puller out there and he's pulling the calf out of the cow and a city fellow stopped his car to see what on earth is going on. 
And the farmer said, hey, you ever seen anything like this before? City fellow said, no, sir, I ain't never seen nothing like this. The farmer said, you got any questions? City fellow said, yes, sir, I have one question. The farmer said, let's hear it. The city fellow said, how fast do you figure that calf was going when it ran into that cow? <laughs> no, 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 we're not separating the rack here, fellas. You know, two people can look at the same thing, and one of them gets the wrong idea of what he's looking at. The Bible warns that <coughs> it's going to happen. Second Peter chapter 3, knowing this first, there shall come in the last days scoffers. Did you know there are people that scoff at the Bible? I deal with them on a regular basis. I attract them like a lightning rod. And the Bible says they're going to walk after their own lust. See, the reason some people don't like the Bible is because of their lust, not because of their science. They don't like that book because it chaps their hide. I tell them, you better get some Vaseline, man. You're going to need it because you're going to be judged by that book, whether you like it or not. Well, the scoffers in the last days, the Bible says they're going to say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were. Boy, that's an important phrase. Peter told us in the last days, the scoffers would say, the way things are happening now is the way they've always been happening. Long, slow, gradual processes. Hmm. Uniformitarianism. The Bible says the scoffers will be willingly ignorant. Willingly ignorant. In the Greek, that means dumb on purpose. They're willingly ignorant of how God made the heavens and the earth. We covered that on video number two, why it's heavens, plural. And how the earth was overflowed with water and perished. The scoffers are willingly ignorant of the flood. We'll cover lots more about the flood on videotape number six. What caused the flood, anyway, and what damage it did to this planet. Well, one of the scoffers in the last days was a guy named James Hutton. James Hutton lived in the late 1700s, and he wrote a book and said the earth is much older than everybody thinks. Now, you need to understand, during James Hutton's lifetime, most people believed the Bible, and most people thought the earth was about 6,000 years old. But this was also a time of many revolutions. We had the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Spanish, the Polish, the German. Everybody's getting rid of the king and establishing democracies. Well, whether that's good or bad is another subject, but the fact is the Bible says to honor the king. And some people thought the Bible was an obstacle to their political objectives. And so they wanted to discredit the Bible. So back when everybody thought the earth was a few thousand years old, James Hutton came along and said it's millions of years old. He was one of the first guys in the Western world to come across this idea and say, oh, wow, maybe the earth is real old. James Hutton developed an idea called uniformitarianism. The present is the key to the past. In other words, the way things are happening now is the way they've always been happening, just like Peter prophesied these guys would come. Well, I think the Bible is the only perfect key to the past, but that's another story. The fact is, James Hutton's book that he wrote had a very strong influence on a young lawyer from Scotland. The lawyer's name was Charles Lyle. Charles Lyle, the lawyer, hated the Bible. Somebody calculated one time that if all the lawyers in the world were laid end to end around the equator, we would all be better off. <laughs> in 1830, Charles Lyle wrote this book right here, Principles of Geology. Here on this book, you can see his hatred for the Bible kind of ooze off every page. This guy really did not like the Bible. He kept referring to it as ancient doctrines. You know, you're outdated if you believe the Bible. He talked about those people who have religious prejudices because they believe the Bible. He said, the men of superior talent who thought for themselves and were not blinded by authority. I mean, you can just skin through, skin through it for yourself talent. and you'll see. Professing he themselves like to be wise. Charles Lyell said his goal was to free the science from Moses. What do you suppose he meant by that? You see, people who read what Moses wrote will feel that God made the world in six days and the flood formed most of the geology of the world. Noah's flood messed up the real estate big time. And if people believe the book that Moses wrote, they're going to think that coal, oil, natural gas formed from the flood when things got buried. And they're going to think the canyons formed as the water ran off from the flood. Lyle didn't like that idea. He wanted people to believe the earth is millions of years old. Charles Lyle, in this book, building on the work of a couple other guys, he developed the idea that each layer of the earth is a different age. And he invented what we call today the geologic column. How many have ever heard of the geologic column before? He divided the earth up into layers, and they gave each one a name, an age, and an index fossil. Maybe you saw the movie Jurassic Park, named after the Jurassic layer. 
Each layer was given a name, and they told everybody how old it was. Now, this was done in 1830, long before there ever was carbon dating, potassium argon dating, rubidium strontium dating, lead, to, lead 208, lead 206, uranium 235, uranium 238. None of those existed. This was all done based on the assumption that each layer is a different age. They made up the whole thing out of the clear blue sky. Imagination. That's a fact. The Earth has many layers of rock. No proof. No question. That's a fact, folks. How'd they get there? Well, there are two interpretations. The evolutionists will say the layers form slowly over millions of years, and each one is a different age. The Bible believing Christian says, oh no, these layers are all from the flood in the days of Noah. The, the layer thing is so dumb, and I'm, I'm sure he's going to get into this. I don't remember if I watched it on here or if I read it in uh, Collapse of Evolution, but like, so they say, well, over millions of years, star dust or whatever, wherever the, the the elements come from are laid down piece by piece and so you you get the Cambrian layer laid and then over time you know more dust and and whatever comes down and you get the next layer and the next layer and then you know so then eventually you get the Jurassic and then whatever so you got all these layers that form over time but um, like some of the evidence is like there's petrified trees that go through multiple layers and a petrified tree is just a tree that's been mineralized, been turned to rock. So you're telling me that the tree just stayed there for the millions of years while the layers formed around it? It just waited for the layers for millions of years. It didn't fall over. Um, so you got petrified trees. You got some that are upside down. So now, now not only do you want me to believe that that tree stayed there for millions of years while these layers formed around it, but now you got one that happened to be upside down and just balanced up upside down and waited for these layers to form around it um plus you got you got uh human artifacts found in the layers you've got parts where so if this is the camry and this is the jurassic or i, I don't know the, the names of them all those are the only two i can think of the camry and then the jurassic and so if this one formed first then this one should be on top of it but in parts of the world it's found this way it's found this you know how did that happen you know and as a matter of fact, nowhere in the entire world um, does it exist in the order that they say it's supposed to in those textbooks. It is not found in that order. You know, so it's all imagination. It's only in the textbooks. In the world, it doesn't exist. Um, what was the other one I was thinking of? Oh, um, so there's evidences of comets and asteroids, you know, on, on our ground. Like meteorites hit the Earth and, and make an impact. Um, those are only found on the surface layer. You're telling me meteorites just started here recently? That they didn't exist in the Cambrian period or the Jurassic period? Come on. It's nonsense. You can get a jar of dirt, shake it up, set it down. It'll settle in the layers for you in a few minutes. Oh yeah, what he's saying right there is you take a uh, jar of dirt, add some water, shake it up, and, and it'll form into layers. Like, it, like the flood would have done, would have deposited it in layers. You, anybody can do that. You could take it, you know, put some dirt in there, shake it up, and watch it settle into its different layers. But the guys, again, who believe in evolution are always trying to erase the line and make you think their interpretation is part of the fact column. The geologic column is actually the Bible for the evolutionist. It can only be found one place on planet Earth. The only place you will ever find the geologic column is in the textbooks. There is no geologic column. This guy admits it. He said, if there were a column of sediments, unfortunately, no such column exists. I had one a, a, a professor I debated one time said, oh, Owen, you're wrong. Now, there are 26 places on planet Earth where the geologic column exists. I said, no, I'm sorry, you're wrong. There are 26 places on planet Earth where the fossils are found in the order you would like them to be. But that doesn't prove the geologic column exists in any of those places. There is no geologic column. If there was in one place, it'd be 100 miles thick. And the obvious question would be, where's all this dirt coming from? Mm -hmm. One of the biggest lies kids face in the textbooks is about the geologic column. It's a joke. It's a hoax. It doesn't exist. But that really caused problems for the world in 1830 when it was taught. We'll get into that in a minute. Look, there's no question the Earth has layers. But if those layers are different ages, why are there no erosion marks between the layers? They all just fit tight to each other like pancakes. I mean, don't you think... 
Is that one layer sat there waiting for the next one to come on top? It rained once in a while in 10 million years? Mm -hmm. Just go home and get a jar of dirt, put some water in it, and shake it up, folks. It'll settle out of the layers for you in a few seconds. It's called hydrologic sorting. Many years ago, I was speaking in Union Center, South Dakota. Union Center is right there. It's not even on the map. And South Dakota puts everything they can find on the map just to fill in the white places. <laughs> there were 40 people in the whole town. 38 of them came to church. I don't know where the other two were. Probably out pulling a calf, I reckon. But we had a great time. It was a wonderful little church out there in the country. The preacher said, hey, Brother Hofer, let's go down to Rapid City. They've got a museum with dinosaurs. I said, man, I like dinosaurs. Let's go. So we all drove down to Rapid City. We walked in the door, and this old fellow met us at the door, and he said, folks, I'm a guide here. Would you like me to give you a tour? We said, that would be great, sir. The first place we stopped on the tour was the geologic time scale. They've got a behind glass all lit up. It's holy. Don't touch it. Okay. We're standing there, and the guide said, now, folks, this layer of rock you're looking at right here is about 70 million years old. And it's so cool, because they always get that sanctimonious tone in their voice, you know? 70 million years old. Oh. <laughs> My daughter raised her hand. She said, uh, sir, how do you know that layer is 70 million years old? He said, that's a good question, honey. He said, we tell how old these layers are by what kinds of fossils are found in them. They're called index fossils. She said, okay. We walked around the other side. We're standing over here. And the guy said, now, folks, these bones you're looking at are about 100 million years old. My daughter raised her hand again. She said, uh, sir, how do you know the age of those fossils? He said, well, honey, we tell the age of the fossils by which layer they come from. She said, uh, sir, when we were standing over there, you told me you knew the age of the layers by the bones, and now you're telling me you know the age of the bones by the layers. She said, isn't that circular reasoning? I thought, wow, a chip off the old block. That guy had the strangest look on his face. It was almost as if he were thinking. He looked at my daughter. He looked at me. I wasn't about to help him. I thought, man, this is going to be good. I got to hear this. He looked back at my daughter. He said, man, you're right. That is circular reasoning. He said, I never thought of that before. That poor fellow drove 50 miles one way that night to hear me speak in Union Center in South Dakota. Praise God. The crowd swelled to 39. We set up a chair in the aisle. <laughs> Afterwards, he talked to me for almost, almost an hour. He said, Hoven, is everything I believe about geology wrong? I teach this stuff at the college. I said, oh, no, man, I like geology. Are you kidding? You've learned the names of all the minerals. Huh. That's a good trick, folks. There are 1,200 minerals. Some have names about this big. I said, you've learned the hardness test, the Rockwell test, the scratch test. I said, no, sir, I like geology. I like rocks and minerals. I have a huge fossil collection, I have a big mineral collection. I like, I like minerals. I said, but the part about them being different ages is all baloney. But he doesn't dare quit teaching it because he'll lose his job. See, people who don't support the evolution theory lose cost. their job in public schools. That's the way it works. We covered more of that on video number seven. The job wants you to lie. You can't work there. It's a carefully protected state religion. I hope that man got born again. It's all based on circular reasoning. I'll show you. This textbook tells the kids on page 306. To date the fo rock fossils, or date, I'm sorry, date the rocks by the fossils. On the next page it says, date the fossils by the rocks. Circular reasoning, this is silly, okay? This guy says, the intelligent layman has long suspected circular reasoning in the use of rocks to date fossils and fossils to date rocks. The geologists have never bothered to think of a good reply. This guy says, I can think of no cases of radioactive decay being used to date fossils. If they tell you they date the fossils by carbon dating or potassium argon or one of those other ones, they're wrong. That's not how it's done. Fossils are dated by which strata they come from. Strata are dated by which fossils they contain. Circular reasoning. Radiometric dating would not even be feasible if the geologic column had not been erected first. This guy says the rocks do date the fossils, but the fossils date the rocks more accurately. I think the cheese done fell out of his sandwich, folks. Okay. It's wicked. It's, it's just ignorance. It's uh, If somebody charges blindness. you with circular reasoning, here's how they answer it. They say, the charge of circular reasoning can be, in stratigraphy can be handled several ways. It can be ignored, 
It's not the proper concern of the public. In other words, it's none of your business how we do it. Or it can be denied by calling on the law of evolution. It can be admitted as a common practice or avoided by pragmatic reasoning. But the fact is, it's all based on circular reasoning. I like to ask the evolutionists, I'll say, fellas, your geologic column contains limestone in quite a few different places. I mean, if I just handed you a piece of limestone and said, how old is it? How would you know if it's 100 million year old Jurassic limestone or 600 million year old Cambrian limestone? I mean, they're both limestone. How would you know the age of it? It's all that's easy. We would tell by the index fossils. Precisely my point. This textbook shows the kids a trilobite. And it says a trilobite's a good index fossil. If you find a trilobite, it probably. So I hope he gets into this here. Um, I'm wondering how much longer I should go. We'll keep going a little bit longer, but they found living trilobites. So how are you going to just find a trilobite and, and assume, oh, it's 400 or 500 million years old? He lived five to 600 million years ago. I don't think so. Somebody found a human shoe print where the guy had stepped on and smashed a trilobite. They asked geologists all over, how could a human step on a trilobite? If trilobites lived 500 million years ago. One guy said, well, maybe. Maybe aliens visited the planet 500 million years ago. Hey, those aliens will do it every time. Another guy said, maybe there was a large trilobite shaped like a shoe that fell on a small one. Well, hey, there are some big trilobites, okay? But they're not shaped like a shoe. Second Peter's got the best story about that one. The scoffers are willingly ignorant. You'd have to have help to be that dumb. You couldn't do it on your own. Trilobite had the most complicated eyeball ever. And that's supposed to be one of the first creatures to evolve in the Cambrian explosion. I mean, come on, it's got an eyeball incredibly complex. Trilobites did not live millions of years ago. There could be some trilobites still alive. There certainly are isopods, which are very similar, except one piece shell instead of three lobes. Otherwise, it could be a descendant, a mutant. Is, by the way, which is a loss of information, not a gain. Look at that nasty thing. This textbook shows the kids a fossil graptolite. This is the New York State fossil. It says graptolites lived 410 million years ago. Only problem is they found graptolites still alive. Now, if they're still alive, couldn't they be found in any rock layer? Mm -hmm. This one shows the kids the Devonian period. It says this is from 325 million years ago. It has lobe finned fish. They got a short leg and then the fin. Well, this is silly. Lobe finned fish are still very much alive today. It's called the coelacanth. And when they first found the coelacanth, still alive in 1938, they said, wow, would you look at this? They survived for 325 million years. It never dawned on them one time to question the geologic column. That thought never crossed their brain. This lady wrote a book about it, A Fish Caught in Time. Yes, boys and girls, this is our own great uncle, 40 million times removed. I'm not sure I can help somebody like that. <laughs> this textbook says the Cretaceous and Jurassic period are from dinosaurs that lived 70 million years ago. Oh, come on. Dinosaurs have always lived with man. We covered that in video number three. Dinosaur blood was found inside a T-Rex bone about 10 years ago. That's crazy. They tried everything they could to dip. I mean, it's only crazy if you buy into the evolution theory, because think about that. You, you want me to believe that blood lasted for millions of years? Didn't disintegrate? Didn't... Uh, get licked up or eaten or wash away or decay that it survived no obviously this thing died relatively recently it's proven and they could this is dinosaur blood cells it's not going to last 70 million years human hands were found fossilized in the same strata as dinosaurs were found fossilized textbooks say the layers are different ages i'm sorry that's baloney now charlie darwin didn't like round numbers he said the well being deposits are 306,662,400 years old. How he knows is anybody's guess. But here they are telling the kids the layers are different ages, and yet all over the world, petrified trees are found, like this one. Just made up, up a number. Connecting different rock layers. Now, if you have a petrified tree standing up, running through multiple rock layers, I don't think it's common sense to say the layers are different ages. Not by much, anyway. I mean, how long can a dead tree stand there before it falls down? Five years, 10 years, 20 years, 5,000 years? Uh, I doubt that. 
and it petrified trees in the poly, they're called polystrata fossils, going through multiple layers. They're very common. Hundreds and hundreds have been found. It would only take one to prove the point. But hundreds have been found, petrified, standing up. In central Alabama, there's a large coal mine where they found all kinds of petrified trees standing up. Now, the kids have been taught for years that those two layers of coal, called the Mary Lee and the Blue Creek Formation, are different ages by millions of years. And yet, when you get all the fossils together, they label them, sample A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. You can put it together and figure out and prove positively that Mary Lee and the Blue Creek had to form within a few weeks or months of each other. That's exactly what you get in a flood. We cover more on that on video number six about the flood, what caused the coal seams during the flood. Here's something from Cookville, Tennessee. Petrified trees standing up, running through multiple layers. It's from the Jogging flood. Nova Scotia is famous for all the trees, trees get the washed and position. they're all swirling around in the water. Most of these pictures are on the website. Everything starts to drain. The tree gets stuck in the We've mud. We've got a piece of petrified wood in our museum running through 12 different, different layers of slate. And they're going to tell you in school each layer of slate represents a different season. That's 12 years. I'm sorry, that's not true. That represents movement of the water and separation of the particles by density or something like that. We'll get into that in video six. So don't let them tell you the layers are different ages. Sometimes trees are found petrified upside down, running through multiple rock layers. Now we really have a problem. I've thought about this one until my brain hurts. As far as I can figure this out, the evolutionist only has two ways to solve this. He can say the trees stood upright for millions of years while the layers formed, slowly formed around them. I find that one hard to believe. Or he can say the trees grew through hundreds of feet of solid rock looking for sunlight. There's a third way to solve this. Maybe those trees were buried in a big flood. How fast was that calf going? Might be two ways to look at this, you know. Yeah. When Mount St. Helens blew its top, it blew thousands of trees down into Spirit Lake. Over 20,000 trees have already sunk to the bottom and are stuck in the mud at the bottom of Spirit Lake. Many thousands of them are standing up in the vertical position. Mm. And those trees are going to petrify. They're already beginning to petrify. It does not take long for things to petrify. Here's a piece of petrified firewood. I've got a piece of petrified pallet in our museum from a pallet shop that cut pieces of wood. Some kid sent me a box of petrified acorns. He said, Brother Hovind, I tried an experiment. I put these acorns in a bucket of water and forgot about them. A year later, I went out and I thought maybe they might sprout, but now they're all petrified. Would you like some for your museum? I mean, they're solid rock. Here's a petrified dog inside a tree in Georgia. They cut the tree down for firewood and said, wait, 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 don't cut that one up. There's a dog inside. Turn to stone. Here's a petrified cowboy boot with the cowboy's leg still in it. The boot was made in the 1950s. Here's a petrified fish giving birth. Petrified hat from New Zealand. Here's a petrified pickle in our museum. I'm not kidding. The guy sent it to me. He said, Brother Holden, we found this old house in Montana. The roof was gone. The house has been empty for at least 30 years. We went down the basement. There's a bunch of jars of pickles, a pantry. But the lid of one of the jars rusted off, and inside the pickle turned to stone. Would you like it for your museum? Yeah. <laughs> a petrified pickle. The jar was made between 1930 and 1960. That's the year they made those jars. I don't know when the pickle got put in there, but sometime in there. Don't let them tell you it takes millions of years. There's petrified sacks of flour found in Eureka Springs, Arkansas, from a fl flour mill that flooded in the 1910s, I believe. So kids, when they tell you the layers are different ages, you're being lied to. That's not true. Don't believe that. 80 to 85 percent of Earth's surface does not even have three geologic periods appearing in correct consecutive order. This guy says it becomes an overall exercise of gargantuan special pleading and imagination for the evolutionary and uniformitarian paradigm to maintain there ever were geologic periods. The geologic column is a hoax. One of the biggest lies ever passed off on humanity, but the vast majority of the world believes it. Even though it doesn't exist, when they started teaching that in the 1830s, people began to change their worldview away from what the Bible teaches to this new view from Charlie Lyle, the lawyer from Scotland, that each layer was a different age. This teaching really had a strong influence on a young preacher from England. There was a fellow that just graduated from Bible college to be a preacher. His name was Charles Darwin. The only degree Darwin ever got was a theology degree. And today they call him a great scientist. All he got was a theology degree. 
which is not bad. I mean, but he, you know, he's not a scientist. Charles Darwin set sail on board the Beagle. He's going to sail around the world and collect bugs for somebody back in England. And he decided to bring some books with him to read. He's going to be gone for five years. As he sailed around, he brought with his Bible, and he brought with that book by Charles Lyell, Principles of Geology. That book changed his life forever. Darwin later wrote to a friend and said, This belief crept over me slowly. I felt no distress. He slowly lost his faith in the Bible. By the way, later when he died, his wife started the rumor that he repented on his deathbed. That rumor still circulates today, but apparently his wife made up the whole thing. Nobody knows for sure, but that's what the best research says. Darwin sailed around the world. He stopped off at these islands right there called the Galapagos Islands. There on those islands, Charlie noticed there were 14 different varieties of finches. A little bird about this big. But their beak shape was different. Now, Charlie didn't like birds too well. I mean, he raised pigeons, but he also liked worms. He was a strange guy. So he shot all kinds of birds, thinking, you know, he would help the worms out, give them a better chance of survival. Because birds ate worms, and he thought that might be kind of hard on the worms, so he shot all the birds he could find. Well, he collected all these birds, and he noticed there were 14 varieties of finches. He studied them carefully and said, you know what, folks? I think all these birds have a common ancestor. I bet you're right, Charlie. It was a bird. And then Charlie said, you know, maybe this proves that birds are related to bananas. He said, oh, he didn't say that. Oh, he sure did. I got his book right here. Charlie Darwin said in his book on page 170, he said, it's a truly wonderful fact that all animals and all plants throughout all time and space should be related to each other. Isn't he saying the birds and the bananas are related? He sure is. That's a lie. There's no proof any animal is related to a different kind of animal, other than maybe a common designer. Charlie noticed what is sometimes called microevolution. Yeah. I don't like that word. I think it confuses kids. Okay, I'm going to use it so you understand what I mean. Microevolution is actually just a variation. Okay? Dogs produce a variety of dogs. Roses produce a variety of roses. Nobody argues about that. It's a fact, folks. It happens. The question is, does it go any farther than that? Does it go into what we call macroevolution, where it changes to a different kind? Paul Brown, in his book in the beginning, an excellent book, by the way, he says microevolution is horizontal. Macro would be vertical, changing to a different kind. Another way to illustrate it. Dogs probably had a common ancestor. Even the Great Dane and the Chihuahua probably had a common ancestor. I wouldn't question the fact that the dog, the wolf, and the coyote had a common ancestor. But every five-year-old kid knows they're the same kind of animal. We had one try earlier in the seminar. We had a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana. We asked the five-year-old, which one is not like the others? He got it right away. The banana. See, the Bible says they bring forth after their kind. National Geographic here has an article from wolf to wolf, how the dog evolved from a wolf. I don't argue with that. It probably did. But it's still the same kind of animal. Yeah, the word evolve is deceptive. It didn't evolve. There's variation within your your DNA is incredibly complex and within your DNA you have information for all sorts of things. You know, I have blonde hair, blue eyes. I could have a kid with dark hair and dark eyes because it's it's can that the information for dark hair, dark eyes exists within my DNA. It's just blonde hair, blue eyes is the dominant uh, gene in my DNA. But that information exists and can be passed on. So all the information for variation exists within a DNA. No new information, which is what evolution would be, is ever added to the DNA. It's simply variation. It's a selective creativity force from God in which he chooses, you know, big nose, little nose, blue eyes, brown eyes, uh, lots of melanin in the skin, a little bit of melanin in the skin. Uh, tall, small, you know, all that it is God knits us together in, our, in, in, the, in the womb and chooses, you know, um, and there's scientific laws. God uses means. So he uses, you know, two couples coming together and having dominant genes and, 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 and weaker genes and whatnot and producing. But uh, there's no new information being added to that DNA. It's simply a selection of information from within that already pre-exists within the DNA. Just one's dominant, one's subservient, one's one's strong, one's weak. You know, in in choosing blue eye, brown eye, whatever. So like, 
in the dog DNA, there's variation, short hair, long hair, big, tall, small, uh, big ears, little ears, you know, and, and then through selective breeding, like, you know, uh, the original canine has four pups or whatever, and uh, two of them are large, they decide that they're gonna, you know, keep, so then they're, the gene selected is the large gene, so now you have large and large coming together, large is going to be dominant, so they're gonna have large puppies, so now they'll, they'll all the puppies they have are large, and then large, large, so eventually that large dominant gene becomes overwhelmingly dominant, and, and so you just get a large dog. In the meantime, the small dogs breed, so the small gene gets dominant, and the long hair, and the short hair, and the big ear, and the long ear, so just all that variation going on could have started with this, but it's the same kind, choo choosing from when, within pre-existing information in the DNA. To change a, a dog into, uh, let's say, a cow, there, there, there's new DNA, there's new information, there's new kind information that would have to be added, which would be macroevolution, like he was saying, vertical evolution, the, or, or wait, which is horizontal. Horizontal is, yeah, vertical evolution. The horizontal evolution is just variation. You know, there's no new information in the DNA. The vertical, where new information is added and it becomes something else, that doesn't ever happen. It has never, ever, ever occurred. It's a myth. It's, 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 it's imagination. It, it doesn't occur. The fact, so, so what they've done is this trickery or they've taken that variation and and somehow blinded the minds of people and said because of that horizontal variation we proclaim vertical transfiguration and becomes something new you know and it, no that's not the way it works there's Mickey Mouse evolving, evolving. The Bible says they bring forth after their kind, not after their species. But this guy says, the results of this and other similar surveys are startling because evolution has been a settled issue for science in science for nearly 150 years. They found out that 46% of adults in the United States do not think humans had evolved. Well, you better define what you mean by evolved. Right, the majority of folks do not think they came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago. If you, if you want to believe that, that, that's fine. I don't care what you believe. What you believe but don't call Where am I at here with the time? 38. I think we'll we'll go to 45 minutes or so and then call it. How about science? Evolution, evolution has, has six, six different, different meanings. meanings. First, First you have to have cosmic evolution, evolution. the origin of time space matter. matter. Secondly, you have to have chemical evolution. The hydrogen from the Big Bang would have to evolve to all 92 elements plus the synthetic ones. Then you have to have what we call stellar evolution. The stars would have to evolve. And nobody's, nobody's ever seen, seen a star form. We, we see them, them blow up all the time. And, and yet there's, there's enough stars out there that everybody on planet Earth can own two trillion of them to yourself. That's crazy. Those are the ones we know about. We don't know about the ones we don't know about. <laughs> then we'd have to have what we call organic evolution, the origin of life. Nobody has a clue how life can get started from non-living material. We'll cover more on that in the next session about the origin of life. Next, they have what's called macroevolution, changing from one kind of animal into another. Nobody's ever seen a dog produce a non-dog. And lastly, we have variations within the kind that some people call microevolution. Okay, this one happens, whatever you call it, it happens. The first five are purely religious. But the definition of the word evolution is really confused for the students on purpose, I believe. I think it takes a giant leap of faith in logic just to go from micro to macro. Sure, it takes a big leap to go to the other four stages. That's how many stars there are. Macroevolution is a fantasy based on imagination. They believe it must have happened. But I don't even know how to. I don't even know what that number is. Teachers, though, will give the students one definition of the word to get them to believe the theory, and then they slowly weed in the rest of it when they're not looking. They're going to say evolution is descent with modification. That's deceitful. That's not really what they mean by evolution. This textbook says evolution is change over time. First definition. Watch how they change the definition now. In other words, living things have changed over time. Wait a minute. What happened to the first four changes? Hold on here. I got distracted. Sorry. Let me... This is interesting. I want to know how many stars there are. Here, um... So... Oh, 
Oh, won't go beyond that. Let's uh, add another six zeros. What is that? We got million, billion, trillion, quadrillion, quintillion. Is it sextillion? So one sextillion, 1.4 sextillion stars. Is that right? Somebody knows math. Somebody knows numbers out there. That's crazy. Man, what has the Lord made? That number, like... We can't even comprehend that. That's how many stars there are. That is mind-boggling. Like, we look into the, the sky, and, and we see all those stars. And, and with effort, you could probably count them. And I just saw a map the other day that showed, like, our galaxy. Just our, our you know, how the galaxy kind of has the, that swirl shape to it. And showed this tiny little yellow circle. Maybe, like, 1% of the map. And it said, when we look in the sky, that's all the stars we see. Is just what's in that little tiny circle. That's, dude, the universe is crazy, crazy big. Another fun side note for you, the word universe. Uni means one. Verse means spoken sentence or sentence. One spoken sentence. God said, let there be. You're going to skip all the way down to the living things and just assume the first four happen. Mm -hmm. Then they say, evolution is a change in species over time. Now they jump right down to what I believe in. I believe species can change over time. I think the changes are limited. Still the same kind. But you might, somebody might call it a different species. Still the same kind of animal. That's not really what they mean by evolution, folks. What they really mean is the whole theory comes as a package deal. Variations, Variations certainly, certainly happen, happen, but they, they have, have limits. limits. Haven't the farmers been trying to get bigger pigs for a long time? Do you think they'll ever get a pig as big as Texas? Texas? No, no, I bet I there's a limit in there someplace, isn't there? I'm not sure if they reached it or not, but they're get, they get, probably getting close to the limit of pig size. Roaches, Roaches eventually, eventually become resistant to pesticides. That's a fact. Do you think they'll ever become resistant to a sledgehammer? No. I bet there's a limit. They always still produce the same kind of plant or animal, too. No new information is added. Yeah. See, real evolution would mean an increase in genetic complexity, not just shuffling genes that already exist. Yeah. When you have varieties of dogs produced, the gene pool is more limited for the variety. The chihuahua is swimming in the shallow end of the gene pool. Somebody spent years crossbreeding dogs to develop a chihuahua. All that time and money to make a dog that is 100% useless. Hey, how long would the chihuahuas last in the real world? Turn them all loose back into the woods and watch what happens. They'd run up to the wolf. Yip, 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 yip. End of gene pool, right? Genetic information is lost, not added, when you get your variety. Real evolution would be an increase in genetic complexity, not just shifting of gene frequency. Yeah. Now, I grew up in Illinois, corn country. Did you know there are so many kinds of corn down there they have to number them? You're driving down the highway and you'll see a sign, you know, BX65, don't mix it up with XL29, something will explode. But I'll tell you what, folks, you can crossbreed corn from now to the cows come home and you're always going to get corn. You're never going to get a hamster or a tomato or a whale to grow on your corn stalk, okay? That ain't gonna happen. There's a variety of dogs in the world, a whole bunch of them. And I bet they had a common ancestor, a dog. This Irish textbook calls it divergent evolution. Saying the terrier and the poodle had a common ancestor, oh come on, don't give it a fancy name, it's still a dog. Don't call it divergent evolution, it's a variety of dog. This Mexican textbook says the horse and the zebra had a common ancestor. I agree, Look like a horse. Four-wheel drive, genuine leather upholstery, all the standard equipment, folks. I mean, the horse, right? And every kid knows they're the same kind of animal. They've got little bitty horses available today. We had the world's smallest horse come visit us at Dinosaur Adventure, man. Talk about useless. Can't ride it. It won't bark. No, my granddaughter noticed. She thought I was cool. I don't know if she thought anything. Uh, <laughs> you know, horses, zebras, and asses can all be crossbred. 
There's some folks in California that wrote me a letter and said, bro, help me crossbreed all sorts of these animals and get some really strange crossbreeds. We get zorses, zonkeys, zeonies, and zedongs, and shebras. There's a herd of zebroids running around. See, the Bible says if they can bring forth, they're the same kind. A horse and a zebra can bring forth. A horse and a hamster cannot. They're a different kind, okay? And most cases, the kinds are real recognizable to anybody with average intelligence. There might be a few questionable ones in there. Okay, I think that's worthy of research. But the fact that we don't have the answer to every single one doesn't prove that everything is related, like the evolutionist says. You know, in the last 100 years, the Kentucky Derby has gone from an average winning speed of 127 down to 123. Now, even back in the early days, they had some low times turned in. All right, we're going to stop there. I hate to stop right in the, the middle there. Maybe I'll back up a little bit for the next time. From an average winning speed of 127 yeah, down let's, to 1. Oops. Let's uh, pick up on that. Kentucky. Every single one doesn't prove that everything is related, like the evolutionist says. Yeah, that's where we'll stop. And then we'll pick up on that Kentucky Derby slide next time. All right, so um, that was a good start. Um, I like uh, number four here. Um, number three, disc number three with the dinosaurs in the in the in the Bible um, was kind of interesting, but not really my favorite section. Um, this is this is pretty good. I think I think number five, dangers of evolution, might be my favorite. I don't know. But this number four is starting out pretty good with the lies in the textbook. Uh, very informative. I um, hope it's helpful to you. If you happen to be watching this and you're on a school board, um, you know, go look up the laws in your state about textbooks being factually um, credible and, 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 and present that. Show them the lies um, and make sure those are removed. Um, you know, science teachers are going to have a hard time teaching this theory without the lies in the textbook. Uh, but students shouldn't be lied to. Um, if you're not on a school board, maybe consider getting on the school board or go to your city hall and present this or, or go to your you know uh, local school. Um, I think you'll you'll see later like it's not it's I think in part disc five he probably gets into it about how it's not illegal for creation to be taught in schools. you know they, they try to bring up that separation of, of uh, church and state. Uh, which, by the way, is not in the Constitution. Uh, it was in a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote. Um, so people try to say that's something that the Constitution states. No, it does not. Uh, the Constitution uh, says there shouldn't be any government-mandated religion, but it doesn't say anything about separation of church and state. You can teach creation in schools. Uh, the problem is is that the uh, organizations like the uh, a what is it ALCU uh, or ACLU and uh, atheist organizations and whatnot uh, will threaten to sue uh, the school uh, if you're teaching creation. And usually the, the principal or the uh, superintendent or whatever um, is afraid of the lawsuit and, uh, and afraid to uh, you know take that to court because of the costs and whatnot. And so they'll just submit. And, and these organizations know that. So just the threat of a lawsuit usually will will uh, get the superintendent or principal to act um, in their favor. And and so it's real wicked that they do that. But if it ever went to court, they would lose because uh, it's not illegal to teach creation. Um, but it is illegal to have these lies in the textbooks. Uh, so they, sh they should be removed. Um, and again, this is such an evil thing. It's it's men who are willfully ignorant. They, they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. They don't want to believe in God. They don't want God to be an option because then they have to give an account. Then they know that the, the things their conscience tells them they shouldn't be doing, they're going to have to answer for that. And so they want to hide from that God and they want to push that knowledge down. They want to blind themselves to that, to, to, to turn a, a deaf ear to the call of conscience. And so this theory uh, helps them do that. This theory is blinders on a horse. It's it's salve on a wound. It's a, a searing of the conscience so that, so they can turn uh, their hearts away from the Lord. And the fact that they promote this and teach this to children 
and and intentionally do this um, it's wicked it's evil it's a plot to the devil to destroy the faith of youth uh, because if children are taught this by so-called experts people they should be you know that they're taught they should trust and then they come home and their parents are teaching them from the scripture something different uh, there's there's major conflict it's what the devil always does it's what he's always done he went to Eve and said half God said getting you to question getting you to doubt and so this this pervasive theory um, throughout all of our culture um, stirs up doubt causes people to question the Lord and uh, as we can see people like Charles Lyell and Charles Darwin uh, they just invented this stuff like that number Darwin came up with for the geologic column 360 million four hundred and two thousand three hundred and sixty two years old come on that's ridiculous that's a he completely made that up that's a he made it up there's no there's no scientific evidence for that there's no it's it's insane these people um, uh, rejected God and and because their consciences were screaming at them they had to find a way to ease conscience and uh, this this intellectual theory is a way to blind the mind and suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Uh, but anyways, uh, we'll we'll wrap it up there. That that's what we got for you tonight. And um, Lord willing, uh, we'll we'll pick up uh, where we left off next time. All right, I appreciate you guys watching. I love you, and Lord willing, we'll talk to you next time.